story how a savior came from glory how he gave his life on calvary to save a wretch like me i heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning then i repented of my sins and won the come forward this morning and I do need to announce Holly gave me this this morning the New Hope Kids Christmas party is going to be uh, December the 11th from 6 to 8 p.m. at Windjammer Skating Rink in Danville there's going to be sign up sheets in the front and back of the church and if you have any questions about that you can talk to Miss Holly McCowan Uh, We also do want to remind you that our uh, monthly fellowship meal will be taking place immediately following our worship service uh, this morning. You are not expected to bring anything at all. It's all provided for you by the church, and we do invite you immediately following our worship service to come and uh, join us for a meal to just extend our time of fellowship uh, around the Word of God together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for another day to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, worship together, bear one another's burdens, and enjoy fellowship together. Lord, we thank you for these songs that we sing. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to give to your kingdom. We thank you for another opportunity to observe your table. And God, we thank you for your word. And we pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear it and receive it today. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.
Amen. Let's stand together and sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, He must hold me fast. He will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast Those He saves are His delight Christ will hold me fast Precious in His holy sight will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last but by him at such a cost he will hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my will hold me fast for my life he bled and died Christ will hold me fast justice has been satisfied he will hold me fast raised with him to endless life will hold me fast till our faith is turned to side when he comes at last he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. Amen.
continue standing for the reading of God's Word as Brother James comes and shares our Scripture reading this morning. Our Scripture reading this morning is going to come out of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, in a response to the first letter that Paul had written to the Corinthians where he dealt with a lot of their sins pretty directly, he says this, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Amen. We'll continue standing as we sing In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone took on flesh fullness of God in helpless pain this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay the light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry till final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home of Christ I'll stand no power of hell no scheme of man can never pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand It is good to be together on this Lord's Day. It's good to be celebrating not only in song, not only in prayer, but in the Lord's table. 
and to gather to gather around his word and then following our time together to gather together for a meal that's been prepared to continue our conversation about the Lord Jesus Christ and his goodness. It is good to be together. The psalm says how good it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And this certainly is a celebration of unity because we believe that no matter what we came in with today, no matter what we're going home with today, there is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this celebration of the table does not give us salvation. It is simply a testimony, a declaration, a commemoration, a celebration dedicated to the one who does give us salvation, and that is Jesus Christ. These elements are simply symbolic. They in no way are somehow mystically transformed into the true body and blood of Jesus Christ. They are a commemoration. They are a symbol that we indeed have been saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice. Every time we come to this point on the first Sunday of the month, we know that the preceding month has had plenty of troubles of its own. Every one of us, if we were to take the time, it would take a long time for us to tell one another all the things that have happened in this past month. And yet every time we come together, the ground gets level. Because no matter what we came in with, there is only one thing that saves, and that's Jesus. That's where we are all on the same page. Before we do that, I want to encourage you to take a few moments to examine yourselves. And as I've said before, and I want to challenge parents in particular, or grandparents if you have grandchildren sitting nearby you, this is one of those moments in the church's life where God has called us to celebrate this ordinance. And it's one of those moments where you can have teaching opportunities like crazy to share with your children why you're doing what you're doing what we're doing, why we do it. It's a great opportunity for discipleship. The elders of this church are happy to assist you in discipleship, but the privilege is yours to disciple your children. It's your responsibility, and we pray you'll take it seriously. Let's bow for a few moments as we spend time adoring the Lord confessing to the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord, and making supplication to the Lord, making our requests known. As you're bowed there for a few more moments, I'm going to ask our men if they would come and prepare to serve at the table. If you're an unashamed follower of Jesus Christ, we invite you as the bread is passed to celebrate the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ.
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As the cup is passed, continue the celebration of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
The scripture says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Holy Father, through the work of your Son Jesus, by the regenerating, saving power of your gospel through your Spirit, we come to you this morning collectively giving thanks. May our words and the meditations of our heart be pleasing in your sight. Grow us through your word this morning. We pray that in your sovereignty you would give the gift of repentance and faith that would cause us to keep on repenting and to keep on believing until the day we see you face to face. Grow us as elders and as sheep of your fold. For your glory we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we continue to gather around God's Word and particularly around our statement of faith and continue to study through that, I do want to make available for you, if you don't have a copy of our statement of faith, we want to make those available to you. So if you want to slip up your hand and we'll make those available to you and give you a copy of that and you can keep that and they will make sure to have one of those for you and you just jot down some of those extra verses that may be coming your way. As those are being distributed, and I assume they have been distributed, uh, everyone uh, would benefit from having uh, one of those. Uh, I would encourage you to keep it with you, keep it handy. There's not a lot of space in between each article, but there is verses that we like to include uh, by way of the sermon that can be helpful on each of those topics. We are looking at article number 10, and if time allows, article number 11 today. They are kind of two sides of the same coin, if you will, um, given to us in regeneration, the gift of repentance and the gift of faith. If we don't have time, we, we won't get to faith. I'll make that determination as we move through the sermon but I do want you to know that the statement of faith is progressive in its nature because Article 1 starts off with the Scriptures as what we believe about the Scriptures. Everything that from that point on finds its resting place or its foundation in Holy Scriptures. And so if you want to look at it this way, the Reformation drove home sola scriptura. That if the Scripture says so, we will yield to it. If the Scripture does not, then we won't. And so all of these things are being based, and these articles are being based in the Scripture. Now today, in Repentance and Faith, let's read both of those particular articles, Article number 10 and Article number 11, and we will begin with Repentance. Repentance, an evangelical grace, a result of regeneration wherein a person being by the Holy Spirit made sensible of the filthiness and manifold evil of his sin, humbles himself due to it with godly sorrow, utterly disgusted by it, with a purpose and pursuit to walk before God, 
so as to please him in all things. And article number 11, faith. Saving faith is the belief on God's authority of whatever is revealed in his word concerning Christ, accepting and resting upon him alone for justification and eternal life. It is worked completely in the heart by the Holy Spirit and is accompanied by all other saving graces and leads to a life of holiness. Now, we believe as a church these articles. The articles in and of themselves are not infallible, inspired Holy Scripture. But they are a condensed description of what we, we believe the, te- the teachings of the Scripture is as a whole, condensed. And so, this matter of repentance and faith is important enough to be clearly defined in the articles of faith. Now let me share with you, even though you may be saying, well, repentance and faith, duh, that's just simple, straightforward gospel conversation talk there. But let me share with you again from that survey among evangelicals in 2018 taken by Lifeway and Ligonier Ministries. Let me share with you how important it is for us to get it specifically right on repentance, what repentance is, what it means. Repentance in and of itself is dealing with a turning away from something. Repent means to turn. So repentance is turning away, and in this specific sense, turning away from sin. And repentance is turning away from something. Faith in that double-sided coin is to turn toward something, and that something is someone, and that someone is Jesus the Christ, none other. So repentance is turning from or away from sin. So you have to tackle this issue of sin. And because we are big fans of true gospel, not cheap gospel, we need to make it abundantly clear that sin must be repented of in the gospel. It must be turned from in the gospel. Let me share with you some of these survey findings. One statement was this. Everyone sins a little... But most people are good by nature. Would you believe that 31% of evangelicals believed that that statement was wrong, that, that uh, they disagreed? However, and that was some of them, were, 7% of those were not sure, but 66% agree among evangelicals with that statement that everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Two out of every three, two out of every three evangelicals believe that, that everybody is good and everybody sins a little, but they're good by nature. Second statement, even the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. The statement was made, even the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. 57%, no, no, I'm sorry, 68% disagree with that statement. 68% of evangelicals, not, this poll's not taken in the bar. It might have been taken in the bar among evangelicals, I don't know. But it's taken among evangelicals. More than two out of three would say that the smallest sin does not deserve eternal damnation. Now, by the way, that becomes a threat against a holy God. Because now you're suggesting that holy God can dwell with a little bit of imperfection. And by the way, once again, 8% not sure. 8% of evangelicals not sure. And it's our responsibility as teachers 
to make sure you're on one side or the other. You're not leaving here not sure. And if you're leaving not sure, you should be coming to me before we go and celebrate food and say, hey, I'm not sure. I don't want to be a part of the not sure. Can you help me understand that? And it'll be our goal to do so. Now, in regards to repentance, we do believe that the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. Because God does not judge sin by size because it costs the same amount of the blood of Jesus Christ to atone for a white lie as much as it did for mass murdering. It took sinless sacrifice to atone for sin, whether it be a small or a big in our eyes. We also believe that people are not good by nature. They are depraved. That every element of their life has been affected by the fall of man. That would have been described in Article 6 of our Statement of Faith. But what does it mean that someone should repent? And in our Statement of Faith, what do we mean when we say it's an evangelical grace? It means that unless someone has been regenerated, it is a result of regeneration. Unless someone has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit through the gospel, they cannot biblically repent. Now, they can turn over a new leaf. They can start a new habit. They can have successful New Year's resolutions. They can change their ways. They can become Robin Hood instead of the IRS. They can do all sorts of things, but they can't biblically repent unless they've been regenerated because to biblically repent, it is produced by, it is a result of, it is a gift through regeneration. And so if anybody's truly repented in the building today, it's because God worked it in you. It's because God gave it to you. It's not something you came up with. It's a gift. Wherein a person being by the Holy Spirit made sensible of the filthiness and manifold evil of his sins. You see, repentance in our definition here means that God opened your eyes. To your deserving of absolute hell. In other words, before repentance was granted, before regeneration took place, you looked at your sin and you saw your sin and you said, you know, I'm not any worse than anybody else. I'm certainly no worse than Mike Gibson. I mean, my goodness, Mike Gibson, gosh, compared to Jackie, he's, he's terrible. You didn't know that was coming, did you? So, you compare yourselves to one another. That's not biblical repentance. You know that it's bad, but it's not as bad as so-and-so. You know that it's bad, but it would have been worse if you got caught. You know that it's bad, but no reason to tell anyone. No, repentance opens your eyes To see that even for the smallest sin, you deserve to be thrown, cast into utter hell forever, for absolute eternity, tormented forever. Not because you were worse than or better than anyone else, humanly speaking, but because when Jesus came from heaven to earth, He was the perfect God-man. He set the record absolutely straight. He had no curve to His grading. He was absolutely perfect. And because Jesus is perfect, it now demands that I be perfect, and I can't be perfect, and for my imperfections, I deserve absolute hell forever no matter how good this life gets I have hell to await for me and every time I think about what I deserve to be cast into hell for it makes me sick I look at it and I see that it's filthy it's ever before me 
Every time I try to push it away, every time I try to quit thinking about it, it's all I can think about. It's in my head. It's in my heart. It is weighing upon me. And not only that, but now I find myself not wanting to do it anymore. I don't just want to turn over a new leaf. I want to start a brand new life. I don't just want to change my friends or my lifestyle or my, my places I go. I want a brand new life. I hate what I've done. I hate who I am. I hate every notion in my heart being evil. And even when I want to think good things, I hate it that my mind goes south. And by south, I don't mean Florida. I mean the flesh. And I have this sorrow within me. Before, before this sorrow, before regeneration, this sorrow was, I'm sorry I didn't do it smarter or or have more success in my folly. I'm sorry I, that I got caught. Now there's something different. There's a godly sorrow about it. Now, now in my repentance, I'm disappointed not because I made my wife miserable. I'm disappointed because holy God shows me the reason for Jesus' sacrifice once again because of my sins. Different perspective. Now I'm disgusted by it. I used to think it was cool. Now I think it's hell deserving. And the Lord in this repentance granting has now given me a totally new desire that is so bizarre to me, it is so foreign to me, it is so foreign to my friends, I don't want to do that stuff anymore. The things I used to do, I don't want to do. The goals I used to have, I don't have them anymore. I no longer want to be successful. I just simply want to be faithful. And while I'm learning what faithful actually looks like, I know that the notion of thinking that successful was my goal, it makes me sick. To think that all I want to be is successful. Now all I want to do is, is walk before God and please Him in all of, all of the ways that I, that I live. I, I want to please God, and, and I'm not sure exactly how to please God. I'm trying to learn that more and more, but doggone it, I want to. My want-tos have changed. This is repentance, brothers and sisters. And it's something you and I cannot muster up ourselves. It comes through the proclamation of the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God impregnates you in regeneration with the gift of hating your sin and wanting Jesus. That's why John the Baptist said, Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. But who can repent unless God grants Repentance. Now, for a little bit more on that description of what repentance looks like, I want you to turn in your Bibles. This is an extra verse that you will want to write down. It's Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42. By the way, while you're turning there, I've had several people ask me, you're reading cross-references from the ESV. Is that where we're going to, is the ESV? The answer is, I don't know. The NIV is what I commonly use, but that was an older edition of the NIV. Since then, they've come up with a new edition of the NIV, which is more gender neutral, which is... <clears throat> so I won't be buying a new one when mine tears up. It'll either be an ESV or a New American Standard. One of the two. Buy them both, you'll have at least one that will work. Maybe a parallel of ESV and ASV. That'd be great. Someone suggested maybe I should start teaching from the Greek. Well, that wouldn't work if we're going to 1 Kings because that'd be Hebrew. And I already spit enough in English. If I tried Hebrew, it'd be worse. No one would sit on the front row. 
So these are all ESV because it was easier to copy and paste ESV than to find the older version of the NIV. So that's why you're hearing from the ESV. Job 42, verses 1 through 6. Let me just set this up and say to you, do you remember Job's experience of difficulties and hardships? Very difficult. He wasn't afraid to go to God with his thoughts. He took all of his anxious thoughts to the Lord. And basically his, his position was, God, I don't know of any sin I'm committing against you. Why are you doing all of this? Am I not trying to be righteous? And God is never afraid of us coming to him with our anxious thoughts. He's called us to do that. But we better be prepared for his authoritative words. Because after Job started making his complaint, God begins to say, Job, where were you when I hung the moon in its place, when I hung the stars in its location? Do you know where I keep the snow? Do you know where I keep the rain? In other words, God was giving Job a lesson of how big he is and how small Job is. After all has been said, this is Job's reply in Job 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear and I will speak, I will question you, and you make it known to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's repentance. He thought he knew God before. And when God, to use a phrase, turns the lights on as to how big God is and how holy He is and how transcendent He is and how small Job is, surely He spoke too quickly. Surely, of all the things He experienced about God and from God, actually left Him only condemnable for the information He had. He really didn't know God for who He truly, truly was. By the way, Maybe if you've grown up in church all of your life, that's the kind of repentance that the Lord has worked in regeneration. Where you knew facts about God, you knew details about God, you understood things about God, but in the midst of Him revealing Himself, you really didn't know clearly, truly, And you never really repented. You never really turned from sin because you thought you had it all figured out. But the one thing that Job had to turn from is thinking he knew everything. And maybe that is the repentance that God grants you in regeneration is to do like Paul did with all of his religious experience and look back at it and say, I count it all as rubbish compared to knowing Christ. Maybe that is what repentance is looking like. Uh, I'll give you another reference that you can go to in the Old Testament. We won't read it, but it's Psalm 51. That's where David confessed and said, Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. And by the way, that is a good reference to go to if you're trying to repent of sin to your fellow man. Let's say that I've sinned against Margaret. Now, it's usually Margaret sinning against me, but just for sake of example. (laughs) She knows that I've sinned against her and she's sinned against me. But according to Psalm 51, my sin is not first and foremost against Margaret. My sin is first and foremost against holy God. And if I don't start there, I'll be trying to fix horizontal relationships without dealing with the vertical relationship, and it'll mess it up, I'm telling you, bad. Because you'll have an inappropriate view, and you may get into a, a contest between who's the worst sinner. You better go to God 
first. He's the one that you violated his holy law against. So Psalm 51 is a great place to go. But let's go to a New Testament example of repentance. It's Luke 19. Luke 19. You know the story of Zacchaeus. A wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Very short in stature, a cheating tax collector. So short in stature that he needed to climb up in a tree to see the Lord Jesus. Luke 19, 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through, that is Jesus, verse 2. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. If I inadvertently said Nicodemus, I meant Zacchaeus. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. I wish I had time to go into detail about Jesus mentioning the doctrine of election there. Salvation's come your way. Why? Because you're a son of Abraham. When was he determined a son of Abraham? Before the foundation of the world. And God, in real time, in real history, showed evidence of that by salvation coming to him. And who was it that told him to come out of the tree? You notice it wasn't Zacchaeus saying, Hey, I'm up in the tree, Jesus, come up here. No, it was the sovereign Savior who said, You get down, I'm going to your house. And there was such a change in his relationship with Jesus as a result of regeneration that what did he want to do? He wanted to make right the things that he was utterly disgusted by. That's repentance. That is, what I can make right, I want to make it double right. Now listen, I'm not talking about guilt-driven reciprocity. I'm not talking about making resolution twofold because it covers the sin double. I'm talking about a heart that's been changed and wants to make things right that can be made right. This is a picture of repentance. A change in the heart about his past and wanting to make a different future. Now, let's talk a little bit about our article of faith that says that this repentance is an evangelical grace. In other words, it's a result of regeneration. In other words, it has to be granted by God. You know, as we share the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ, it is our prayer that God grant repentance to everyone we share the gospel with. You, do you understand that? Every person we're sharing the gospel with, we are praying God grant them repentance. But ultimately, we are truly relying on God alone to grant that repentance. Let me ask you a question give you a quick example. Any of you have children that you're hoping will come to faith in Jesus Christ? Slip your hand up. Okay. All around the room. Have you shared the gospel with them? I hope the answer is yes. Have you exposed them to the gospel? I hope the answer is yes. But you know what you're waiting on? God to do the work of regeneration through the Holy Spirit and give them the gift of repentance so you know what you're watching for? 
fruit of repentance. You're you're watching that plant that you call a kid, that tree that you call a kid, to drip fruit of repentance, which will also similarly drip the fruit of the Spirit. Because if the Spirit is in them, He's producing fruit of repentance and even fruit of faith. But it's God who grants this. So you parents and anyone else who's sharing the gospel is reliant upon a sovereign God to grant repentance. Look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Now in our our article of faith, we actually have included Acts 2, 37 through 38, which is a good one about repentance and faith. But look at Acts 11, 18. I would jot that down in addition to our article. Acts eleven eighteen. when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. God has granted repentance that leads to life. They didn't go find repentance. They didn't go buy repentance. God granted repentance. Look with me also at 2 Corinthians 7. These verses are included in our article of faith. 2 Corinthians 7. Second Corinthians 7. Verse number 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. Innocent of what matter? That should be the question you come to. Innocent in regards to what? Not innocent in doing wrong but innocent in the fact that they're not trying to fake repentance with a worldly sorrow. This is so important. Because if you're wondering how you know if someone's repented, here's the the definition in verse 11. What's this godly grief done in you? Godly grief that leads to repentance. An eagerness to clear yourselves. Indignation, fear, longing, zeal, punishment. In other words, discipline. In other words, when that sin happened, when that sin became evident, there was a longing to make things right. There was a longing to do the right thing. There was a longing to get away from that which is promoting evil and clearly distinguish yourselves from that which is promoting evil. That is the fruit of repentance. And worldly, grief produces death. In other words, it leaves regret. If the only thing you're regretting is that you got caught, you have a worldly sorrow. If you're regretting that you disappointed God and don't want to do it anymore, that's a godly grief. Let's go to another passage of Scripture. That one is quite helpful. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11 is in our article of faith. Now let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 1 in regards to repentance. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 9 and 10. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. There was a marked change in the Thessalonians. Do you remember when I said that repentance is turning from something? And in that same regenerating work, faith is to turn towards someone. So repentance is turning from sin, faith turning toward God in Christ Jesus. The Thessalonians turned from idols to serve the living and true God. That's repentance And faith. This repentance was to turn from idols. Let me ask you a question. In our current culture, have you thought, have you thought that repentance from idols is something that requires statues and um, maybe a replica of a God that? that actually is a physical, tangible item that's in your house. Don't be so foolish as to think that that's our form of idols. Turning from idols, meaning their attention is no longer on this particular item. Their their devotion and concern is not on this particular item. It's towards the living and true God. You know what one of the greatest forms of idolatry is, in my observation, in the Christian community? Children. Children. Let me, let, let me just be pastoral for a moment. Our attention is all on child and what satisfies them and what makes their life easier and their life more convenient. And we want to be their buddy instead of their parent. And we we want to make decisions that would make them happy. I'm telling you, that's a sin that needs to be repented of. Turn from that idolatry and turn toward the living God. I need to preach a series on this issue because we're so blessed, so blessed with children and with a culture that has anything for children at their fingertips. And oftentimes we are being a willing party to our children's death. And oftentimes I say, that dang kid... Of yours, not mine. Isaiah knows that's not true. Where where is Isaiah while I just mentioned him? There he be. Where he be? Anyway. He should be an easy guy to spot, but I know he's been sick. And I'll say those darn kids... And yet we are the fools. And there's only one way to stop that, and that's own it as sin and repent of it. Idols come in many forms. But the Thessalonians were known for turning from idols and to the living God. Sometimes the idol in this particular culture can be success. 
While we're speaking of teenagers, there's quite a few in the room. And the older generation would like to promote a career path for them. Their high school guidance counselors are trying to help them with a career path. And having a career is not bad in and of itself, obviously. But have we ever considered for one moment in regards to a teenager contemplating a career path, what does God want? Or does it always tie itself to money? In our culture, unfortunately, it does. And that's idolatrous. And the church better repent of that. God has not called teenagers to be successful. He has called the Christian teenager to be faithful. Whatever and wherever that is. Now another text, 2 Timothy 2, this not in the article of faith, 2 Timothy 2, continuing to think about repentance, and I'm making the final decision, we will not be venturing into faith today. And many of you under your breath and in your mind are going, we could have told you that. Oh, I didn't know the yes was coming so quickly. Happy. Happy. Hungry, not happy. (laughs) So, we'll stop with repentance, but let's look at a few more texts. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. This is in regards to pastoral leadership. Able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This is not a passage to advocate that the preacher is always right. The preacher is not always right. This is a passage that I'm bringing to our attention to let you know that you can give as a faithful minister or a faithful ambassador for God's Word, you can give the right biblical information to a person who is dissenting or disagreeing with you. But it will be God alone who opens their eyes to grant them repentance to see the error of their ways. That won't be you or me and and our convincing argument. It'll only be God who grants that repentance. That's why we shouldn't get too mad and rattled when we don't see repentance happening. It's a a work of God. This is the great news, though. Because it's a work of God, you don't have to worry about messing it up. God does it. Let's look at Titus chapter 2, another text. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. And again, we are reiterating, as a church, we believe the biblical doctrine of repentance. That it is a gift granted in regeneration. Titus 2, verse 11 For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now look what the grace of God does. Training us. Now, stop right there for just a moment. If you don't believe in the doctrine of election, and you believe in universal atonement, you would think that the grace of God brings salvation for everybody, and it's going to teach everybody how to say no to ungodliness. But the text is clear that even though salvation is is available to all types of people, the bottom line is in verse 12, it trains us. The grace of God is not training everybody. The grace of God is training us. 
Well, what is the grace of God? It's the gospel. What comes in the grace of God through the gospel? The gift of repentance. It trains us. The grace of God trains us, teaches us to do what? To renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The grace of God teaches us to change our ways and change our thinking. The grace of God is teaching us Think about this, brothers and sisters, since regeneration in your life where God granted the gift of repentance and faith, how much has the grace of God taught you since that time? About your views on particular things. How has the grace of God taught you in regards to your view of money, possessions, relationships, church involvement, Bible reading, prayer? The Spirit's work, Christ's atonement. How much has the grace of God taught you about how to be patient, how to be long suffering, how to forgive? Has the grace of God taught you anything? Yes. If you're regenerate, the grace of God is always teaching you until the day you see Him face to face. So, in regards to this issue of repentance, I want us to close as we've been closing in the preceding weeks with reminding you of how this article affects how we operate as a church. Because the church is called to disciple, it's called to fellowship, it's called to evangelize and outreach, and it's called to prayer. In regards to discipleship, I need to be faithful to disciple people. By teaching God's Word and disciple them. And so the question is, in discipleship, the, qu the forward question is this. Have you practiced biblical repentance? For some of you, I just want to be forward with you. Confronting you about your need to repent at this point in your life is simply just something inconveniently brought to your attention. Here comes the preacher again. I don't want to be bothered by that, but I need to be respectful and hear what he's got to say. But here's what the preacher's longing for for you. Is that I'd never have to tell you again. Because God did something in your heart to make you long to obey Him. You see, let me, let me dispel a myth to you children. Parents don't get some sick thrill out of getting on to you and correcting you. You know what? If, if you really want your parents to die quick, start obeying before they ever have to tell you anything. They would delight in that. Because they, they would be assured something's happening inside of you that they could not complete or do the task of themselves. Quick way to put your parents in the grave. Start obeying. They'll die of shock. But what if you have practiced biblical repentance, what's been the effects of that? You know, the proverb says that the way of a transgressor is hard. It means to keep on sinning and stay in a sinful pattern, that's a hard life. To lie and have to lie, to cover a lie. to, to, to oh Man, that's a hard life. That's a busy, busy, hard life. The way of a transgressor is hard. But what about just stopping dead in your tracks, confessing sin and saying, I don't want to do that anymore. I'll tell you what the effects will be. A restoration of the joy of His salvation. That's what the effects will be. While everybody's looking at you as if, 
you scumbag, can't believe you did that. God is saying, a broken and contrite heart, I will not turn away. The embarrassment may last horizontally, but you are accepted in the beloved. And that's a blessing. What about fellowship? How does repentance affect fellowship? Well, an attitude of repentance will foster fellowship in the church. And an attitude of unrepentance will be very divisive and keep people at bay. And so fellowship is affected greatly by our view of repentance. It even gets into church discipline. When someone is unrepentant, they must be, their attention must be called to their need to repent. And what about outreach? What about evangelism? How do we view repentance? Well, this keeps us from promoting an easy believism that neglects repentance. This keeps us from saying on a soccer field among 250 players, every head bowed, every eye closed, who don't want to go to hell, raise your hand. And tons of people raise their hand. By the way, in that method, I never knew of anyone who slipped up their hand to say, I want to go to hell right now. Nobody wants to go to hell. Especially when you think about who might be there as a kid, you're thinking about that. We stay away from easy believism because we believe that an evangelical grace is the gift of repentance. One young kid from another church came and asked me one day. He says, he says man, I'm so excited I got saved. And I didn't want to be a party pooper, but I asked him, saved from what? Well, he didn't know. I'm not saying that a kid can't understand the gospel. But I'm saying that a kid should understand the gospel before he says he's got it. So we better make darn sure that they understand what repentance looks like. And it may be as simple as I disobey my parents. And I love it when I do so. And I love the fruit of my disobedience. And it's awful. They may not word it that way. But they better have a clear understanding of what repentance even means. And then how does it affect our prayer life as a church? Well, let me tell you this. If you were in Sunday school this morning, you heard these words. If I regarded iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not hear me. What's that mean? It means the same thing that it meant in the book of Joshua when, the, when, when Joshua and the Israelites went to fight and Achan, who had taken some of the spoils, some of the goods from the enemy, and hid them in the camp, and the, and the Israelites were rendered ineffective in battle. Why? Because sin was being harbored inside the camp of the Israelites. And until it was confessed and dealt with, there was no success in battle. What's the point? Prayer ain't even going above this 14-foot grid if we're not being honest with our sin before a holy God. Confession. Repentance. It affects our prayer life. Well, this is my prayer before we head out to enjoy fellowship with each other. I'm praying that as we read Scripture... The Spirit of God is taking the Word of God and zeroing in on people's lives personally. And through the Spirit's work, He's granting regeneration and the gift of repentance. Now, what's that going to look like? Here's what it's going to look like. And let me just put this in your head before you move into a time of talking. Is your mind starting to change about your sin? Are you looking back at your life and knowing what was deserving of hell and there's a disgust about it? There's a longing to not want to do it again, not because it wasn't cool or you, you, you got caught and the consequences were terrible, but because it defies a holy God's expectations. And you know that your sin is the very reason that Christ... gave himself as a sacrifice. 
Is your mind starting to change about what you want for your future? You want to be faithful to God? Where do you think you got that from? You think, you think the church is just handing that out? Listen, if it's a work of God, it, put it this way. If it's a thought that you can put to rest, and Monday through Saturday you don't even think about it until the preacher starts talking about it again, it's doubtful that repentance has been gifted to you. But if you go home Monday through Saturday and from time to time the thought is haunting you that your sins deserve absolute hell and you want nothing more than to embrace Jesus Christ and follow Him the rest of your days, I believe that's God working in your heart to bring about repentance. It's something the preacher nor a church experience can do. If that's the case, I, I trust that he will push you to trust in Jesus Christ and want to even follow through in baptism and declare that you're not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus. In other words, if regeneration's happened, it will show up soon enough, even in repentance. Let's pray. If there is questions about what we've studied today, if you need further clarification, you come and talk with me. I'd be glad to talk with you. If there are no questions, let's enjoy what we've heard from God's Word and let's celebrate through a time of a meal that's already been prepared for you. You don't need to bring anything. It's been prepared for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to grow in our faith. I thank you for granting repentance through your gospel. I pray, God, that you would continually do it not only for salvation, but keep us repenting, keep us believing. Persevere us. For your glory, we pray. Bless our time together, the food that's been prepared. Strengthen us through our conversation and the eating with one another. May we take fellowship seriously as we rejoice in the things of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Directions for the meal, if you just go down this long hallway into the fellowship hall and the food is there for you. God bless you.